Okay, so we're the, the theme of this retreat is praying with the English mystics. And today I want to focus on a 20th century mystic, uh, Evelyn Underhill. Tomorrow and Thursday, we'll go a little bit back in time and look at, at two significant figures from the 14th century. But I thought maybe we'll start a little bit closer to our own day. Uh, Underhill, if you aren't familiar with her, she is a delightful figure, very um, accessible, very warm, and truly someone who I find is deeply inspirational, not only in terms of the life of prayer, but just overall in terms of the life of faith, of um, growing closer to God, of, of developing a closer relationship with Christ. So what I'd like to do to open our time together is invite us into a moment of prayer. And I'm going to read a prayer from a book that just came out a year or two ago. It's called Evelyn Underhill's Prayer Book. And it actually was a collection of prayers that she wrote by hand. And it was discovered just a couple of years ago and then published. And she didn't write very many of these prayers. Most of them come from the tradition. The prayer I'm, I'm going to lead us with, it doesn't say who wrote it. So it may have been by her and it may just be unattributed. But as we move into prayer, let's just take a moment now and acknowledge that even though we are just connected through the internet and even though many, many miles separate us, that I still acknowledge and affirm that, that promise from Christ that where two or three or more are gathered, that he is present. And so let's acknowledge right now the divine presence that's truly in our hearts as well as in this gathered place. O oh, divine beloved, give us joyfulness of heart and peace of conscience, continual gladness and consolation in your word and promises, that we may evermore be thankful unto you and praise your name forever. Amen. So today, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Evelyn Underhill and about her life and writings. And then we'll narrow in on her contribution to spirituality, looking at one book of hers called Practical Mysticism. And from that book, we'll explore some of her specific teachings about how we can engage in our spiritual practice. So here I am standing in front of Evelyn Underhill's house, which has an English heritage plaque on it. It's still standing in North London. She lived from 1875 to 1941. A little bit of personal trivia, she and I share the same birthday. We were both born on December 6th, the Feast of St. Nicholas. So I think that's kind of sweet. Um, she's an author. She wrote two volumes of poetry and three novels, but she's best known for her many works of inspirational, spiritual, Christian nonfiction. She's considered a leading voice in the 20th century revival of Christian contemplative and mystical spirituality. Here's a quote from uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury from the 1960s and early 70s, uh, Michael Ramsey. Evelyn Underhill did more than anyone else in Anglicanism to keep the spiritual life alive in the period between the two world wars. Uh, but of course, she was active even before World War I. The, the book that we're gonna focus on today, Practical Mysticism, was actually published right at the beginning of the First World War. So there you can see the, the Blue Heritage plaque from her house, which is at 50 Camden Hills, Camden Hills Square. And she lived there for most of her adult life from 1907 to 1939. So most of her, uh, her literary output 
was written while she lived in that particular house, including her most famous book, which is Mysticism, and then her book, Practical Mysticism, which came out in 1914. She was born into a secular Victorian home. So her family was, was Anglican by name, but not so much by practice. But she became interested in spirituality, especially when, as a young woman, she and her mother would typically take summer vacations to mainland Europe. And she basically fell in love with uh, church art and architecture. And so art and architecture, beauty, really became the threshold by which she entered into uh, an intentional adult spirituality. Interestingly, she spent a season of her life interested in magic and the occult, but she eventually pulled back from that and became interested in Catholic spirituality and the Catholic mystics, but eventually uh, realized for matters of personal conscience, she didn't feel called to actually become a Roman Catholic. And actually later in her life, she did become quite active in the Church of England and became renowned as a spiritual director and a retreat leader. Her first major book was Mysticism, published in 1911. And at that point, uh, a figure also important in kind of the mystical revival, uh, Baron Friedrich von Hugel, uh, became her spiritual director. And the two of them worked together until um, his death in the 1920s. And to his credit, although he was a Catholic layman, he, um, he was somewhat scandalized by the fact that Underhill did not have engagement with a faith community. And so he was the one very instrumental in encouraging her to become engaged with the Church of England. Among her many accomplishments, she was the first woman to lecture at Oxford University on religion. She was a, only a guest lecturer, but still a lecturer at Manchester College in the year 1921. This is her grave, which is in, um, in the Hampstead uh, region of London at the Hampstead Parish Church. It's a very patriarchal gravestone. You'll notice it is the name of her husband, Stuart Moore. And then underneath it, it says, and his wife, Evelyn, daughter of Sir Arthur Underhill. And so that's, you really have to know what you're looking for to find her grave. And I visited this a couple of years ago and, you, you know, it's just kind of overgrown. I spoke with the, um, with the, the priest at, who was, who was celebrating the Eucharist that Sunday. I don't think she was the rector of the church. And she said, oh, it, it, we really need a new gravestone. And my understanding is there is a, um, is a campaign to raise funds to give this grave a more befitting marker that would actually acknowledge how significant the person is who's interred there. Evelyn Underhill uh, influenced many people. She influenced C.S. Lewis, Thomas Merton, T.S. Eliot, uh, Richard Rohr, Charles Williams, even Alan Watts. She was very much interested in, in uh, ecumenical and even interreligious dialogue towards the end of her life, especially active with Anglican Orthodox dialogue was a staunch pacifist at the beginning of World War II. She was someone who, who clearly understood that faith is not just uh, nice, cozy thoughts about God, but that needs to be manifested in one's life. And uh, von Hugel directed her to, to work with people who were in need. And so she, she uh, devoted two afternoons a week, really for the rest of her adult life, to, to working with folks that that um, oftentimes she would work with women whose husbands were alcoholics. Remember, this is before AA. You know, I, I like to think about Call the Midwife, only this is a few decades even before Call the Midwife. So, so she, um, she, she understood that part of the Christian life is, is practical love of our neighbor. So her major works, I've already mentioned a few of them. Uh, Mysticism, I think this, this book here, this is a cover of the, my first copy of this book. I think it wins the award for the ugliest book cover of all time. It's a classic case of you don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, it came out in 1911. Then three years later, her book, Practical Mysticism. The lectures she gave at Oxford were published as The Life of the Spirit and the Life of Today in 1922. 
The other book that is considered her other major book, aside from mysticism, was a book on worship, an ecumenical study of the many varieties of Christian worship. It came out in 1936. And The Spiritual Life in 1937, which was a collection of radio talks that she gave. I don't think the audio uh, exists of those. I sure would love to hear them if they did, but I think it was just a little bit too early. And, and the book was published from, from probably from her script. And then finally, her letters published posthumously in 1943. And, I, and if you're new to Evelyn Underhill, I would strongly encourage you to look for her letters. Unfortunately, they're out of print right now, but I think you can get used copies for not a lot of money online. And her letters really reveal her warmth and her character. She adored cats, and she always had several cats with her. And the cats never show up in her books, but they frolic all through her letters. So especially if you're a cat lover, you would probably really enjoy that aspect of her. Some themes in her spirituality. First of all, mysticism. It's such a, it's such a big word. Uh, it means many, many different things to many people. But Underhill had a very incarnational understanding of mysticism. It's not a flight away from the world, but it's really this idea of finding communion with God and cooperation with God here on earth, bringing heaven into earth. She was one of the first and certainly not the only voice in the 20th century to proclaim that mysticism is not just for the spiritual elite. It's not just for saints, for priests, for nuns, monks, the especially pious. It's for, in her language, normal people as well. I'm not sure if I qualify as a normal person, but I, I think I'm kind of a down-to-earth person, and so I really appreciate the earthiness that she brings to her spirituality. Not surprising given her love for Christian art and architecture, but she insisted that the next closest thing to mystics in terms of people who truly embodied the spirit of God at work in the world would be artists. And, and several people who, several scholars who have written about Underhill, uh, there's one book in particular, she's called The Artist of the Infinite Life. And I think it's a beautiful way of describing her given the, um, the focus on beauty and art in her own writing. And then finally, she follows Julian of Norwich, who we'll take a closer look at tomorrow, that she really sees love as the, the heart, the anchor, the heart, and the ground, and the center of the Christian life. Here's just one quote from her. The spirit of worship is the very spirit of exploration. It has never finished discovering and adoring the new perfection of that which it loves. So she sees the spiritual life more than anything else as a grand adventure of love between creator and creature. Practical mysticism. What most of the material we're going to look at today is drawn from this particular book. I think it's a really appropriate book for us to look at right now, given that we are in the middle of this pandemic. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety in, in our society at this moment in time. This book was written at a time of profound anxiety as well. She dedicated the book to the unseen future at the, at the very beginning of what was then known as the Great War. Uh, the books Mysticism and Practical Mysticism, think about them almost in terms of theory and practice. Mysticism is a huge book, over 500 pages, uh, and it's really her magisterial survey of what mystical spirituality is. Practical Mysticism, by contrast, is a very short book, only, let's see, I have my copy right here, only about maybe 160, 170 pages, much bigger type, much more accessible. It's the practice book. It's the book of how do you take this great spiritual tradition that we have and apply it to our lives today. Now, the book is over 100 years old, so I want to acknowledge some of the language in it is very dated, but even so, it's, it's an accessible book and it's, it's filled with insight. She bases much of this book on the spirituality of the Spanish Carmelite nun, St. Teresa of Avila. So kind of have a little bit of a hybrid here. Evelyn Underhill stands squarely in the Anglican or the English tradition, but with that ecumenical spirit, she, she certainly draws from this Spanish Carmelite nun. She, she describes in the book, the promise of the book is to help ordinary people to live a mystical life. Sounds like a big promise, 
Um, and maybe after we go through the conference, I'd love to hear from any of you if you think this might help somebody on their way. She, she talks about some language that you'll be familiar with and some language that may be new to you. She talks about meditation. She talks about recollection. And she talks about three dimensions or forms of contemplation. Ironically, though, prayer is not a major concern of hers. The word only appears once in the entire book. And I think part of that is because this book comes at the beginning of her career. She became more kind of dialed in to prayer as the heart of ordinary spirituality later, later in her, her life. I just do want to mention right now, just a word about Underhill's language. Uh, the reality is all the quotes today come from either mysticism or practical mysticism. Over 100 years old, Underhill uses gendered patriarchal language. Uh, I, I'm sorry about that. I made the editorial decision not to mess with her. Uh, so I'm going to ask your forbearance if that language is difficult for you. Uh, I acknowledge that, and I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm just going to ask that, you know, in your own heart, you can do a little bit of translating. I, I imagine, like so many writers of her generation, if she were writing today, she probably would be, you know, have a different philosophy towards, towards the, the pronouns and the other language that she uses. Okay, so let's move on. First of all, I'll get a little geeky here, but I promise we won't stay in, in geek world. Evelyn Underhill could be described as a Neoplatonist. Her spirituality very much has kind of a Greek quality to it, and very much this idea that we have the material world, but that woven into the material world is a spiritual reality. And that the spiritual life is kind of learning to calibrate our heart to that spiritual reality, which may not be available to just ordinary senses, as you can see from these two quotes right here. The evidence of the senses cannot be accepted as evidence of the nature of ultimate reality. The senses are useful servants, but dangerous guides. The sphere of our possible intellectual knowledge is thus conditioned by the limits of our own personality. Now, I, I'm gonna be honest with you, you know, I twitch a little at this idea that my senses are a dangerous guide. Um, and that may be, again, the reality of living in 2020 as opposed to 1914. But it also shows that maybe my spirituality is not quite as Neoplatonic as hers is. Um, the, you know, the reality is, is, of course, our senses can you know, lead us astray sometimes. But, but the basic reality of life, the, you know, the foundation of all human knowing is that we have to trust the information that we receive, whether it comes from our senses or from our heart. And I think what Underhill is just pointing out to us is that don't let your senses be your only guide. Trust that intuition that comes through your heart as well. So what I'm going to do is just conscious that there may be some people on the um, on the, the retreat that don't have access to a screen, when I pull up a, a longer quote, I'm going to read the quote, and then I'm going to forward to the next slide where we're going to highlight certain amounts of the quote, certain words within the quote, and then we'll kind of focus on that a little. So here is Underhill talking about mystical prayer. This comes from her earlier book, Mysticism. She says, it has nothing in common with petition. It is not articulate, no forms. It is not else but yearning of soul, the expression of our metaphysical thirst. In mystical prayer, the soul is united to God in its ground, the created intelligence to the capital I intelligence in create. Without the intervention of imagination or reason, now my Jesuit friends might take argue with that, but, or of anything else but a simple attention of the mind and an equally simple application of the will. Its development involves a steady discipline of the mystic's rich, subliminal mind, slowly preparing the channels in which deeper consciousness is to flow. This orison, a fancy word for prayer, seems rather a free and mutual act of love, a supernatural intercourse between the soul and the divine, or some aspects of the divine, sometimes full of light and joy, sometimes dark and bare. So I've highlighted a few words that I think we might want to just focus on here. 
that she sees prayer in terms of yearning and in terms of thirst, that the focus of spiritual or mystical prayer, contemplative prayer, is union with God, even at a level, again, deeper than the ordinary machinations of our mind, our imagination, or our reason. She focuses on the reality that prayer is not just a one-off thing, that there is a steady discipline to the life of prayer. But having said that, it also involves this free and mutual act of love. You can see that theme of love. It just keeps showing up in her work. So, so we, we enter into a discipline, a practice, something that takes us beyond the intervention of the normal kind of, you know, dynamics of our mind, acknowledging this hunger or this thirst in our heart and entering into the threshold of love. And I, and I hope you can hold on to those themes because I think you'll see, not only do they show up again and again in today's conference, but you'll see them tomorrow and Thursday when we look at a Julian in the cloud as well. So meditation, it's, it's, it's a word that we often use in, in contemporary spiritual conversation. Let's see what Evelyn Underhill has to say about it 106 years ago. She says, it's a halfway house between thinking and contemplating. As a discipline, it derives its chief value from this transitional character. The real mystical life, which is a truly practical life, begins at the beginning, not with supernatural acts and ecstatic apprehensions, but with the normal faculties of a normal person. I do not require of you, says Teresa of Avila, to her pupils in meditation. I do not require of you to form great and curious considerations in your understanding. I require of you no more than to look. And I, it reminds me, I know Brother Aiden in his recent um, uh, retreat on contemplative ecology quoted that line, I think it was a Jesuit who said it, that contemplation is a long loving look at the real, real with a capital R. So I think Underhill is standing in that, that same tradition of this kind of gaze, this kind of beholding, that's a word we'll see again tomorrow, this adoration that's at the heart of, of meditation. So her definition of meditation is a little bit different than what we might call meditation today. Think of Zen, of um, mindfulness-based stress reduction, of centering prayer, other practices like that. She, she sees meditation as not necessarily a discipline to kind of this gesture of letting go of our thoughts, but really beginning with our thoughts, and then maybe not ending with our thoughts, but beginning there. She does recognition, recognize that we all have unruly, noisy, distracted minds and hearts, and that's why I have a little monkey here for my, um, my image, because it comes from that Buddhist notion that we all have a monkey in our mind, the little monkey who is constantly chattering, constantly screeching, constantly distracting us. As T.S. Eliot said, distracted from distraction by distraction. That seems to be the human condition when it comes to prayer and meditation. But Underhill sees meditation as the dawn of interior awareness, even before we embrace a disciplined practice. So, you know, she talks about discipline practice as the heart of mystical prayer. So this is maybe pre-mystical practice, simply beholding, simply looking and acknowledging that we're not very good at looking thanks to that little monkey. But then Underhill introduces this word recollection. It's not a word that I, I really use in, in, you know, when I lead retreats now or I write about it on my blog. So it's kind of a word that's fallen out of favor. Um, and, and, and it's going to show up again and again over this retreat. So, so let's look at what she has to say about it. This comes from her book, Mysticism. The self concentrated on an image or idea, dwelling on it more than thinking about it, as one may gaze upon a picture that one loves falls gradually and insensibly into the condition of reverie. And protected by this holy daydream from the more distracting dream of life, sinks into itself and becomes in the language of asceticism, recollected or gathered together. Again, we can look at the words that she's focusing on here, this, this quality of dwelling. Again, this, this, 
theme that's showing up again and again, this idea of the gaze or of beholding. But then she introduces this notion of reverie, this notion of a holy daydream. What we might say is maybe moving into an alpha state or moving into a slightly altered state of consciousness. We, we move away from the normal distractions of the monkey mind. We sink within ourselves. Maybe even in, in the Orthodox tradition, we talk about sinking from the mind into the heart. And then we become recollected or gathered together. So here, if meditation is that pure act of beholding, with recollection, we begin to look at what kind of a practice, what kind of a discipline can we bring to bear on our spiritual lives? Now, Underhill would have never heard of centering prayer. The, the term wasn't even um, invented until the 1970s. She, to the best of my knowledge, did not have any deep knowledge of Buddhist practices such as shamatha, calm abiding meditation. So, so she's really drawing more on whatever resources would have been available to her at the time. And I think we need to acknowledge that that Western Christianity went through several centuries, even before the Reformation, although the Reformation probably didn't help matters any, but several centuries where there was really kind of a, a, a suspicion towards interiority. Interiority was seen as maybe, um, you know, navel gazing or indulgent. It wasn't really what the gospel mandated of us. We were supposed to be missionaries. We were supposed to be soldiers for the kingdom, onward Christian soldiers. There wasn't time for this kind of monkish self-indulgence. So Underhill is swimming against a headwater. We today, a hundred years later, we are the tremendous beneficiaries of her work to really bring the contemplative tradition more accessible to ordinary Christian women and men. But even though she didn't have, have the access to the kind of spiritual resources that we might know today, she certainly has this sense that there is a place for discipline in prayer. And in that discipline, we begin to discover silence within us. At first, we may be just lucky to get glimpses, but it's there. From recollection, she then uses a term, again, that we don't often hear now, the prayer of quiet, the prayer of quiet. She says, in recollection, the surface mind still holds, so to speak, the leading strings, but in quiet, it surrenders them wholly, allowing consciousness to sink into that blissful silence in which God works and speaks. This act of surrender, this deliberate negation of thought, is an essential preliminary of the contemplative state. It's a very interesting line there, a preliminary of the contemplative state. Underhill right here, she reminds me of Thomas Keating, who constantly would say that centering prayer is not contemplation. Centering prayer is a preparation for contemplation. Underhill seems to be echoing that same idea a century earlier. So this idea that we move into silence it's still primarily our action, our intention that takes us there where we can more attentively attend to or pay attention to the silence that is within us. And that that, by the grace of God, can prepare us for contemplation. So what is Underhill saying here? That if we persevere with a spiritual practice, a practice of prayer, we will encounter moments of grace, silence, and stillness. These are often beyond our control. They are, they are the action of the spirit in our hearts. We cannot engineer, manage, or control them. However, once we see, once we behold, once we gaze into the vastness of interior silence, we know it is always there, even if, thanks to the monkey, even if we cannot immediately access it. It's like there's an old, I think it's a Buddhist story of somebody who's in a dark room and they, they are kind of feeling around in the dark and they feel something that feels like the tail of a snake and they get really scared and they go to the other end of the room uh, because they're afraid of the snake. And then somebody comes along with a torch and they just stick the torch into the room just for a second. And they realize it was just a rope lying on the floor. And the person with the torch leaves and walks away. And the person in the room is back in the darkness. 
but they're no longer afraid because they know that it's just a rope. They're not a snake. Us using that, but kind of twisting it around, that there is this vast reservoir of interior silence in our hearts that we often do not attend to because of just the normal rush and noise and distraction of life. Moments of prayer that, that, that come as grace through a practice such as learning to gaze our heart into the love of God, learning to recollect our attention to that single focus can lead us to that point of acknowledging that, that place within us. And then even if we can't find it, we know it's there. Now we're going to look at what Underhill has to say about contemplation. And she, in her book, Practical Mysticism, she basically says there are three forms of contemplation. So we're going to look at these three forms one at a time. So here's the first form of contemplation. And again, remember, she's talking now about we're following recollection about this idea of a practice. She never uses the word prayer, but I think it's fair for us to say she's describing a form of prayer here. All of these are forms of prayer. And so she says you are to push back the self's barriers bit by bit until at last all duration is included in the widening circles of its intuitive love. Now, what does she mean here? It's a wonderful uh, a line in the book of Ecclesiastes that says, God has put eternity into our hearts. God has put eternity into the human heart. And that's what this, this line from Underhill reminds me of, is that, that in our prayer, we learn to recognize that all duration is included in the intuitive love in our hearts, that, that the eternity, the timelessness of God is already given to us. Until you find every manifest in every manifestation of life, even those which you may have classified as cruel or obscene, the ardent self-expression of that imminent being whose spark burns deep in your own soul. If any of you hang out with Jesuits, what this reminds me of is that kind of Ignatian tagline, find God in all things find God in all things, that this is really what Underhill is, is, is suggesting, is the beginning of contemplation, learning to recognize the presence of God everywhere. And she points out, you know, maybe it's easy to find God in a, in a majestic mountain vista or, or in the vastness of the sky or in the, the sparkling eyes of a newborn baby, but she, she doesn't let us off the hook. She says, contemplation also means learning to find God in those things that we may not particularly find appealing or attractive. That's what the all in all things means. And it's not just St. Ignatius, I, I pulled on him, but uh, St. Benedict, uh, the, the, you know, the founder of Western monasticism writes, we believe that the divine presence is everywhere. Julian of Norwich, who we'll get to know much better tomorrow, the fullness of joy is to behold God in all. So this is an ordinary fruit of the prayer of recollection and quiet, the ability to discern the divine presence. So now we move to the second form of contemplation, again, quoting Underhill. As your, as your contemplative prayer deepens, she says, quote, you will observe that you have entered into an intense and vivid silence a silence which exists in itself through and in spite of the ceaseless noises of your normal world. Within this world of silence, you, you seem, as it were, to lose yourself, to ebb and to flow, to wander and be lost in the imageless ground, says Roisbrecht. Roisbrecht was a Flemish mystic who lived in, um, I think, about the same time as Julian of Norwich, maybe a little bit ahead of her. Struggling to describe the sensations of the self in this, its first initiation into the wayless world beyond image, where all is yet in no wise. So what is she saying here? Well, the first thing I want to do is if you're thinking, well, it seems like she's kind of just repeating what she was saying about meditation, recollection, and quiet. I think that that there is an obvious parallel here, that the, that the three forms of contemplation parallel meditation, recollection, and quiet. 
well then what's the difference between them? And I think that the key is that contemplation is always a gift of grace. So meditation, recollection, and quiet may be forms of prayer that we initiate that, that emerge out of our own yearning, our own hunger. And as we persevere in our prayer practice, more and more than there are gifts of grace given to us that we have, we have no control over. And that's profoundly humbling. And yet that is a constant refrain of the tradition, 2,000 years of Christian spiritual tradition, that as we advance in our prayer, our prayer becomes more receptive. So the intense and vivid silence that she spoke of in that quote is a received graced silence. Contemplative prayer, always a gift of grace. We do not cause or control it. We simply prepare ourselves to receive it. And any of you who are practitioners of centering prayer, you know that that was, again, Thomas Keating's constant teaching, that centering prayer is a gesture of consent, that we consent to the action of the Holy Spirit, acknowledging that we cannot engineer, manage, or control that. So finally, we come to Underhill's third form of contemplation. And she says that at this point, as we, as we reach this kind of place in our prayer journey, we come to, quote, an attitude of perfect generosity, complete submission. Again, language we don't necessarily hear nowadays. Willing acquiescence in anything that may happen, even in failure and death, is here your only hope. For union with reality can only be a union of love, a glad and humble self-mergence in the universal life. You must, so far as you are able, give yourself up to, die into, melt into the whole, abandon all efforts to lay hold of it. Whew, it's elevated language there. And I think that there are some parallels here between Underhill's third form of contemplation and Teresa of Avila's seventh mansion. If you're familiar with Teresa's book, The Interior Castle, considered kind of not only a classic of Christian mysticism, but a classic of world mysticism. Teresa of Avila suggests that there are seven mansions that the soul travels through in its journey towards God. The seventh mansion, of course, is the mansion where we enter into what she called the transforming union, the, the ultimate merging of the soul with the divine presence. So this signifies an extraordinary and profound level of spiritual maturity. And let me inject a little bit of 21st century humility into this, uh, this exploration of Underhill. I think that when I think about her third form of contemplation or Teresa's seventh mansion, where my mind always goes is to the thought of people who are truly gifted, people who are gifted musicians, gifted athletes, um, you know, gifted artists. It's wonderful that some people get there, but you know, it's okay if it isn't me. That not everyone necessarily gets to compete in the Olympics. Not everyone wins a Grammy. And it's okay. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who I mentioned, um, he actually corresponded with Underhill. He, um, he said, towards the end of his life, he said, when it comes to mysticism, the mystics are the mountain climbers, but I am a man of the foothills. And I love that humility. Of course, I think he was being overly humble because I think C.S. Lewis was a mystic, but that's another conversation for another day. But the reality is, is that there is a mysticism of the foothills. There's a mysticism of the plains, just as there's a mysticism of the mountaintop. And... Um, and what Underhill points out here is that even if we yearn for the mountaintop experience, that at the end of the day, it is only God's grace. And it's an inscrutable mystery why, you know, Eric Clapton can play the guitar like Eric Clapton, and I have a hard time with a simple chord progression. Don't ask me to explain that. The reality is, is that's how the world works. But isn't it a good thing that, that, more people play the guitar than just Eric Clapton. And that's the thing that I think we have to keep in mind here is that, you know, every generation there is, there's a Thomas Merton or a Cynthia Brugeau or a Teresa of Avila or an Evelyn Underhill. There's always these great mystics who are so inspirational for the rest of us. 
They're like the Eric Clapton's, the great guitarists. But you know what? Isn't it wonderful that, that, that Cousin Vinny can play the guitar and he brings it to a family get-together and we all enjoy singing and listening to him play? And yeah, he and his buddies play down at the local bar and they make a little bit of money. But he's never going to record. He's never going to win a granny, Grammy. But he still makes music. He still finds joy in it. And I think that that's something that, that we have to come back to when we think about these elevated forms of mystical spirituality. Maybe they aren't for everybody, but the forms of spirituality that we do find manifest in our lives are just what God has given to us, and that has grace enough. So to summarize, what is Evelyn Underhill basically saying here? Well, with meditation, she's, she's inviting us to learn how to pay attention. That paying attention, and she said, you know, begin at the beginning, begin right where you are, just in the ordinary um, warp and weft of your life. You know, the, the, if your mind is a monkey, you begin with your monkey mind. If you're, if you're just kind of an emotional wreck because this, this pandemic has, has caused, you know, a financial burden and you've got, uh, you know, I, I, yesterday I found out that a, that a friend of mine had had COVID. Fortunately, she's better now, but was very, very sick. You know, it's, it's, it's devastating, you know, how this disease is making a difference in our lives. But this is where God meets us, right in the challenges of the present moment. Learn to pay attention. And then the second thing she says is, we need a practice. You know, prayer isn't just something you do when you feel like it. I mean, it's okay. God loves us if, if we go through life just praying when we feel like it. But if we truly are interested in embracing a contemplative spirituality, there's something to be said for showing up. Was it Woody Allen who said 90% of life is showing up? I think that certainly applies to the contemplative life as well. And then as we, as we practice prayer, then this, this invitation to notice silence, even the silence within. It's not always easy. If you're like me, you know, when I go to a monastery where, where you know, monks or nuns are the custodians of silence, and I, I enter into the joy of external silence, I'm always humbled by the interior noise that I encounter in that external silence. So, so we have to learn not only to enjoy the external silence when we find it, like at a monastery or in the wilderness, but especially that internal silence that all of us have, but many of us have not learned to notice. And hopefully a, a, a disciplined prayer practice can help us to find that interior silence. Finally, contemplation is grace, something we prepare for, but we do not control. So pay attention, learn to truly see, notice what arises, live in the present moment. We, if, if you're anything like me, I put a lot of energy in my life to um, planning and to speculating and kind of what am I gonna be doing next week or next month or next year? That has its place. But the moment of prayer is the moment of, again, to use that fancy old-fashioned word, recollection of being here and now. Adopt a practice. Fortunately, again, those of us who live 100 years after Underhill, we have some wonderful resources at our disposal. In the Christian tradition, we have centering prayer or the Jesus prayer. There are certainly uh, practices from other traditions, such as Zen, Shamatha, secular practices like, like MBSR. But if, even if you do adopt a non-Christian practice, the invitation is to bring a prayerful sensibility to that practice. Persevere. The blessings of interior silence are yielded over time. So we, you know, part of this is learning with the humility to accept that silence can be fleeting at first. And then finally, really, you know, borrowing the language from Thomas Keating, but I think it, it, it resonates with Underhill. Let prayer be a gesture of consent. The grace of contemplation will arise when we least expect it. Our job is to be non-attached to outcomes and to simply be present. Okay, do we want to read this one? I'm, I'm just conscious of time. Let, let me just read this real quick. What is being offered you is not merely a choice among new states of consciousness, new emotional experiences, though these can be evolved in it but above all else, a larger and intenser life, a career, a total consecration to the interests of the real, 
This life shall not be abstract and dreamy, made up of negations. It shall be violently practical and affirmative, giving scope for a limitless activity of will, heart, and mind working within the rhythms of the divine idea, both deep and wide, embracing in its span all those aspects of reality, which is the gradual extension of your contemplative powers have disclosed to you, making the inner and the outer worlds to be indivisibly one. It will matter little where and how this career is actualized, this career meaning the mystical life, whether in a convent or a factory, in your study or a battlefield, in multitude or solitude, in sickness or strength. These fluctuations of circumstances will no longer dominate you, since it is love that payeth for all. Once again, just to highlight, she is suggesting that the life of prayer is a larger and intenser life, practical and affirmative, that it goes both deep and wide. And I think especially here in the 21st century, uh, for me, I love going deep within the Christian tradition, but I want the wideness of interfaith, ecumenical and interfaith dialogue to learn from people whose practices are different from my own. And then finally, this idea that the inner and the outer worlds are ultimately indivisibly one. So a final word from Evelyn Underhill. Remember, God is acting on your soul all the time, whether you have spiritual sensations or not. A little nugget of practical wisdom from her letters, which, um, like I say, are absolutely wonderful, and I hope that um, you can you can uh, experience them. Maybe you have to go to the library to do it, but they're worth checking out.